Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Brass Junkies. Edition, episode, uh, installment. installment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I am your host, Andrew Hitz, and I am joined by my co-host, Lance LeDuc. Lance, how are you? I'm very happy. Yeah. Very, very happy. Oh, good. Good. That's that's uh, that's not a bad place to be. Lance has construction. Back porch got set up today, so I... Um, oh. Uh, uh, so, yeah. That's good. Good. Um, so, we have I got... Have a construction. Yeah, they're, 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 they'll... Uh, but that's okay. And, and and my kid is homesick from school. So, yeah, he's upstairs. He might join us. There might be some beeping construction noise. What could possibly go wrong, Lance? No clue. <laughs> We have a listener's choice for you. We have got uh, three really good questions, and uh, and then if there's time, we've got how many a bad bon- ones? A bonus. <laughs> yeah, there's two crappy ones from uh, Suzanne and uh, Paul. Really bad. No, uh, that that's that's a, a good point. Uh, I wanted uh, to take a second to thank Parker Mouthpieces. Parker. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the the. I, um, yeah, by the way, his, uh, his wife's foundation, Harmony Arts, uh, foundation, they, uh, helped us, uh, with the scholarship drive for the tuba workshop. And so I want to occasionally, uh, thank them because they are amazing and they do really good work. So go uh, and check them out. Link in the show notes. Uh, and also, thank you to Parker Mouthpieces uh, for providing the hosting for the Brass Junkies. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including the Andrew Hitz Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece and the Lance LeDuc Model Euphonium Mouthpiece. I just used the TEM cadence where I only mentioned the Andrew Hitz one, and then there was like the end of sentence, and, I was like, and the Lance LeDuc Model Euphonium Mouthpiece. You can find out more at ParkerMouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Twi- uh, also, uh, Patreon patrons, you're the best. We love you. You can go to uh, patreon.com slash the brass junkies and you can learn all about how you can get access to um, dozens and dozens of bonus episodes and bonus content and behind the scenes reports and uh, and you can help keep the lights on around here. So thank you very much for that. All right. Are we ready for the first question, Lance? Are we? Yes. <laughs> First question is this. Uh, the first question is from Suzanne in Madison, Wisconsin. How many days did the typical Boston Brass album take to record, and what did those days look like? <clears throat> that's that's a good that's a good question, mm-hmm. Suzanne. That might, which might be why we chose it. It'd be funny if we just went through and and chose really bad ones for an episode <laughs> and pretended that they were not bad. Um, I would say that the typical, the typical one we would usually. Now it depended. There were some that we recorded like with the Syracuse University Wind Ensemble or with the Capital University Wind Ensemble. Those were different because they involved, you know, eighty other people. Moving parts. Yeah, yeah a lot of moving parts. But the uh, Boston Brass alone, I would say typically we would schedule five days for a recording session. And we had a rule that we would try to never go longer than four hours. Like we would, and 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 part of that was also just um, was uh, was logistics because we would typically re- um, record in churches for the for the most part. Sometimes concert halls, um, and you can't have with the level of mics that we would be using that the that the recording engineer would be using. They pick up absolutely everything. I mean, they pick up like air conditioning that's going on in the background. And so you can't have lots of traffic driving by. You can't have, uh, you know, helicopters overhead. You can't have like any of that stuff, no matter how faint it is, it will come through. So the typical recording session would not start until like 8 p.m. So it was common for it to say be like 8 p.m. until midnight. Also, those spaces tend to have... Uh, whether it's even the the custodial people who are there to you know clean the toilets and to you know mop the floors and whatever are not there at 11 p.m. They're there at two o'clock in the afternoon, and it's not really fair to rent a place and then like disrupt everyone's lives that has anything to do with the building and tell them that they can't come in. So um, it was typically at night, 
And, uh, and obviously you can't go from eight until like three in the morning. I mean, some people do, but, um, I, I always found that there was a diminishing point of mental returns for me. It was less about the chops. It was more about the mental. Would you agree, Lance? Totally. Yeah. It was always, a, not always, but almost always a, a, a concentration issue more than a stamina issue. Yeah. Yeah. When the red light goes on, it's, uh, it's something that you get good at. I remember the first time, the first album I recorded with Boston Brass, which was within earshot, um, I didn't enjoy the process very much at all. Um, I didn't dislike it either, but I didn't enjoy it because it was one of the most stressful things that I have encountered as a professional. Uh, and I was prepared and I was, I was warmed up and I showed up early. Like, you know, like nothing went wrong. There was no equipment malfunction. There was no like, you know, recording engineer running out of tape. I mean, it was ones and zeros at that point, but you know, it's like, there are things that can happen that can completely throw a wrench. None of that happened. It was just really, really high pressure. And I remembered J.D. Shaw told me, he was like, you're going to learn to love this. Actually, it might have been Rich, Rich Kelly, I think, who said, you'll you'll learn to love recording. And sure enough, I did, like right after that, because I was really happy with how it turned out. Um, but yeah, the, my brain would go before my chops, like all the time. Yeah, all the time. Um, and then we, we typically would end sessions early, too. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I don't think I've ever been on a recording session with you where we didn't end at least a full day early, or we had the luxury of being able to stop earlier than we had to like the second to last day to be able to just do like one last thing on the final day when we were completely fresh with the chops and completely fresh with the brain. Yeah. And that just kind of gives you a little bit of, uh, of leeway. I, I, recording is my favorite thing to do. I mean, I, I would much rather, I mean, just the concentration part that like Zen out thing is like, my favorite and then to have to replicate it over and over just love 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 yeah one of the other big things the other tricky part about recording in a in a space like that and ha having to do it at night the temper like the thermostat becomes a really important thing because the blowers for either the ac or the heat are not that they don't have filters that could eliminate them but better if they don't need to use them yeah. so then sometimes you're getting real hot or real cold depending on when you're recording and the time of year and where you happen to be. But yep. um, do you remember for the brass recording project that we, um, that we did at the, the Landon school where I taught lessons for a little while, we couldn't figure out how to turn off the air. And it was like, it was winter break. That's why we were in there. It was like the first right. week of uh, January. And, um, and we found where it was and like, we, I think we could have turned it off, but I, it turned out it was a really good thing that we didn't. Cause it was like, you know, very old, uh, you know, like decades old building and, um, the band director, uh, Earl Jackson, who's an awesome dude. Like he could have made things okay, but like Earl would have gotten a very angry phone call from, uh, from the person who would have had to have undone what we did, you know, like, cause they don't have my number. So they would have called Earl. Um, so, but yeah, you know, it's stuff like that where I remember didn't that brass get stuck. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember that. Oh yes, I do. It's one of the happiest moments of my life. Yes. Yes. Kevin Jibo. Uh, he's a horn player. No trumpet, trumpet player. That's it. Uh, yes. He, <laughs> there was like, there was like this much snow on the ground. There was like a 16th of an inch of snow and there to get out of the land and school parking lot. There's like about a, a, a six inch rise over, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> for like an eighth of a mile. And he had like, um, you know, he had some like sporty something or other and yeah. like, yeah, it was, it was a total trumpet move, you know, and he had like fancy tires, you know, that would help him go like, you know, zero to 60 and like 0. 0.0001 seconds faster, not like which he never utilized. And, um, and he could not get up the hill. His tires were just spinning. And, um, and we, we helped him immediately. We didn't, we didn't laugh at him at all. We didn't, um. We definitely didn't pull out our phones and film any of it because that would have been awful. I can't but, remember know. how we extricated him, or did, did we participate, or how did that happen? I, we kind of we we participated eventually. <laughs> yeah, did we push him? Like I kind of I kind of can't remember now. Yeah, I I think that we also just like helped him like find a new route kind of thing. I mean, there's only oh, so many yeah. ways out of there. Um, and yeah, I think that we helped push. Uh, yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, once he finally got up to the top of the hill, he rolled down the window, and he's like, because we were all like, we were giving him like a, right, you know, Landon School is a huge campus, and we were in the middle of it, there's like no one within earshot, so this is like late at night, but we're like screaming like he had just won the World Series, uh, and, and you know, he, 
He's like, I'm bringing a different car tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You yeah. showed us. Yeah, yeah that was uh, that was funny. That's pretty funny. Note to self, I have to remind Jibo to listen to this episode. So, yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> that was So, good. back to the recording thing. You know, some of the times we would end early. Well, we always... It seems like you're right. Like, I, well, I think that goes to the planning. Like, you just plan more time so that you don't have to stress out. You just yes. know that you have the dates booked for the engineer, for the room, for the players. And then there's just no, uh, oh, my flight's at blah, blah, blah. But then you can also... Because the other part of it is knowing which pieces to record in what order. Yep. And, the, and, and where to start in a piece. Because it, it isn't necessarily... It isn't automatic that you would start on measure one of the first. It was highly unlikely that you would start on measure one of the first track of the album. It's highly unlikely you would know the order of the tracks on the album at yeah. that point. Yep. But so, so once you sort of figure out, <clears throat> we're going to do this one first because it's kind of a, you know, you don't want to do anything that's crazy over the top aggressive and you don't want anything that's crazy over the top touch, like super quiet, delicate playing right out of the gate is dangerous. You want kind of just like a, you know, right up the middle kind of solid get on base and then then you, yeah. you're looking at these big legos in the day like you have to decide you know you let's say you planned to go for four hours and you're at the three hour and 15 minute mark and you finish a tune you've got all of the stuff in the can that you need well then if the only other pieces that you have are really long or really touchy or really you know, aggressive, it's probably better just like call it there. Like just put this 45 minutes away and let's just come back fresh tomorrow. It does no one any good <clears throat> to end the session after a 15 minute break with like half an hour of frustrating, like, yeah. and not like over the top frustrating, even just like kind of low key frustrating. Cause you're feeling great. It's like, it's awesome. And then you just kind of not feeling it. That's, um, you know, when, uh, I know I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but, um, but uh, at this point, what haven't we? It's been a long time. The mm. uh, that when I first time that I produced a recording session uh, was for a quintet, and first thing I did was call or I texted Sam. I was like, you know, like tell me, like what do I need to do? Um, you know, what 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 is unexpected that I should know? You know, like what do you wish you knew before you were produced? And he was like, I'll call you in five minutes. Was the text, and <laughs> then uh, that that's when I knew I literally had a piece of paper and a pen. And I took notes, and that's a TEM episode. It's uh, Sam Palafian on producing, uh, which we'll throw in the show notes. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it was it was awesome. It was a masterclass. I, I wish I'd recorded. I couldn't. I was just on my phone, so it's just me like, kind of sharing all of the notes. And I took copious notes. But he talked about how producing is about it's more about the humans than it is about the music, and you absolutely need to have the ears because like when you say it's done. Sometimes when you're uh, on the, you know, the one playing the instrument, you maybe got it, but you're not sure. Like there's something that's just kind of tripping you up. And when there is a great producer who has great ears, who you trust, who says like, if Lance is in the booth and I'm recording something, he goes and he says, hits, you've, you've got it. We're good. We have more than one. Then I will not just be like, okay, I'll just be like, good, we're done. Because I know that there is a 99.9 .9 repeating percent chance that I'm going to agree with that assessment once we get to the other side. And in the 0.000001% chance that I don't, he, I will probably come to the conclusion that he was right anyways, because I was like running into a wall and that we just needed to go around the wall, <laughs> you know? Um, and so it's like, it's really a human level thing. So it's all about momentum. I think like both like playing wise, but also mentally. And, and it, it um, I feel lucky that uh, my first recording with Boston Brass, like they already knew what they were doing in a lot of ways. Like we didn't really mess with the formula much after I got there, even though that was a whole bunch of albums ago. Um, because they, you know, they they told me like their first album, they had like 10 hour, and I hear for groups that have like 10 hour recording sessions. And it's just like, I mean, I, I could do that. I'd put like, wow, it was just the amount of, of energy that I would have to expend to um to to get the same results um is um you know and that is a way to i guess to save money if you gotta rent the space for less time but like whew, man that's that's not um that's that's not a good formula i don't think mm. for for anybody especially brass players where there's like yeah. a you know yeah trumpet and horn with small mouthpieces it's an issue yeah no kidding well and on the on the in the under the producer's hat <clears throat> sometimes if the group 
feels like they want another one, even though you have the one, you know, you have it. Sometimes it's good to just let them do it. And then yep. they feel like there's yep. like a, just psychologically, it kind of uh, keeps, keeps things rolling. It is true. Yeah. And, and, uh, and sometimes you can, yeah, it, it, there's, there's an art to figuring out who is asking for it. Why do you think that they're asking for it? Because then you can also sometimes reassure them in a very specific way like what you've already got or not, mm -hmm. or you could understand that what they're really asking for is for somebody else. And, you know, and you obviously can't say into the speaker, like, like, no, man, the tuba part sounded fine there. You know, like <laughs> when, when the trumpet player was like, can we do just one more, you know, for safety? Right. You know, it's like, there's just ways to, um, yeah, there's, there's ways to do it. So, yeah. Well, and that on the, on the, on both sides of that too, say, can we have another one? Cause I want to try a different thing or can we do another one? Because, this is a thing you may not have picked up on, but there was a blah, 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 or whatever. You know, so you just, it, the honesty, like owning up, like the, you get in trouble and I've recorded some student groups. Um, nobody wants to own up in the moment because of the social, you know, like, but uh, it's likely that things are going to slip through for the producer, or the conductor or the, whoever the leader is. But if you don't own up to it, then you're just delaying when the people are going to be mad at you and there's nothing to be done about it at that point. Then like you've kind of ruined it for everybody. Cause you just didn't have the wherewithal and the maturity to say, look, I'm real sorry. I know we did this 19 times, but we got to do it a 20th. Cause I, I chewed that thing. Yeah. Way better to do that. Fall on your sword then. Cause then, I mean, you're putting the whole thing uh, yeah. at risk. Otherwise yep. Yep. it's hard, especially if you're not new, if you're new to it, it's a difficult thing to do, but, you know, hopefully you have open enough and honest enough lines of communication within the ensemble and then between the ensemble and the, the producer or the tone master, whoever, and the engineer, which should be different people, if at all possible. Uh, just somebody whose sole responsibility is to check levels and make sure that the recording is going and then stopping when you want it to. And then somebody else whose sole responsibility is to be uh, nose down in the score and ears yep. open and listening. Those should be two different roles. They yep. don't have to be, but but it better be, it better be a it better be a Clark Rigsby. You know, it better be somebody who is expert at both. Um uh, because you just have you have to split your attention. So speaking of splitting attention, why don't you tell us about the beautiful people at Duquesne? You know, the Duquesne University is a fine institution. Actually, the NCAA uh, playoffs. There was a some of the games took place at uh, Duquesne University uh, the day before we are recording this. I don't remember which ones, but it uh, doesn't matter. Any old how. Across the street from that arena is the Mary Pappert School of Music, and in the Mary Pappert School of Music, there's a wonderful array of um, ensembles, classes, and uh, professors with whom you can study, um, and they are some of the best in the business. Lots of folks from the Pittsburgh Symphony, uh, as well as James Gourlay, who's kind of, um, uh, you know, taken over the universe in Pittsburgh in all the right ways. And so... For a uh, second, I thought you said it's some of the best musicians in Pittsburgh and James and Gourlay. And James Gourlay. That's funny. <laughs> that would have been funnier. That would have been funnier. He would have appreciated that. He would have. He would have laughed very hard at that. Yes. Sorry, James. Sorry, <laughs> sorry for the compliment, James. Um, so... We want to encourage you to click on the link in the show notes to go visit the site. And if you are um, an aspiring uh, college student, check out the programs that are going on there. And a very, very special thanks to the other James, uh, much less helpful Nova, for making this all possible. Also, if you are a prospective student looking at Duquesne who happens to be into Star Trek, then um, yeah, Jim Nova is really big into Star it's Trek. All about so. Star Trek. Yeah. Yep. Just, uh, yeah. just, just ask him. Uh, all right, <laughs> Paul in uh, Toronto, Ontario. Who's your favorite comedian? Well, that's a that's a hard one. I don't know if I could come. I mean, if I had to, if, if forced to choose one, I guess I would just go with Seinfeld, just because of the craftsmanship and the just because of the craftsmanship. Um, but then I don't know how I leave out Steve Martin because of the trajectory and the the sum total of his career and output. You know. Seinfeld is way more of like a traditional stand-up. Not that he, of course, he, of course, did other stuff. But Steve Martin is way more of a renaissance man in terms of all of the ways that he's uh, entertained us. Um, current, my current favorite, like new person, is uh, Nate Bargatze. He's hilarious. Have you listened to him? Mm -mm. 
Oh man, he's got two or three specials. I think they're on Netflix. And and there's it's worth watching them in order. He did one that was an episode of a thing called Comedians, I think. I think Comedians. So it's just a 20 minute set and then he has two 1 hour sets. And there's a couple of bits that come back with updates. He tells that he sets it up in such a way that you don't have to have known the other ones, but if you do, they're uh, extra special funny. He's his persona is like a dumb southern guy, but uh, he's he cracks me up, man. He's very 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 funny. I mean, there's just a lot of super. Te- I mean, Chappelle. It's hard to it's hard to overlook Chappelle and Chris Rock, Amy Schumer, Ali Wong. I mean, there's like I guess, but you know. I go back to Seinfeld just because of the... I appreciate the craft part and him like pulling the back of the curtain and allowing people to see right. you know, what went into it. Actually, his latest book is called Is This Anything? And it is, it's just his stand-up. It, the full, it's everything that he's ever... Every joke he's ever written and performed is in this book. And really? it goes by decade. Yeah, it's really good. I mean, wow. if you're into stand-up comedy, it's really right. good. If you're not into stand-up comedy, you will not find this book entertaining in any way. Very interesting. Uh, all right. Yeah, Paul. So the question was, who are your favorite 14 comedians? Right. Um, the uh, Stephen let's Wright is, should be on the list, too. <laughs> was, How many am my, I up to? Eight? My, my favorite my favorite Stephen Wright was uh, was the uh, was uh, I read. I read that uh, 90% of all uh, automobile accidents happen within five minutes of the home. So I moved. <laughs> So that's stupid. awesome that's so i also stupid. like he had the one i have a, i have a light switch in my house that doesn't go to anything periodically and when i walked by i would flip it on and off six months later i got a letter from a lady in germany that said cut it out <laughs> that's funny i love that guy <clears throat> yeah he's good um the i don't know if you know this lance that that's boston uh, guy uh yeah well and in fact a uh, long time ago now uh there's the construction for lance New, mm-hmm. uh, New Year's Eve, 1994, first time that Fish ever played the Boston Garden. Uh, they, for one of their songs, which has like two like spoken lyrics, like in the entire thing, um, like Steve, like, and there's this like raging jam going, and Stephen Wright just comes walking out. It's like, is that that's Stephen? And then, and then in his like deadpan monotone, like said the you know the first set of lyrics, and the place absolutely exploded, <laughs> and the band was laughing hysterically. The place is screaming, laughing. Stephen Wright is the only guy in the hall. He's just <laughs> looked like he was waiting for the bus, and then he and then he delivered the second line, and then the end of that tune is like you know is like about a minute long explosion, and then he just and he just kind of like bowed, and then he walked off. Like completely expressionless, never broke character, never didn't even shake Trey's hand, just like just left very slowly. That was uh, thanks. That was that was funny. Uh, so mine, I would I would say I've got two answers. Uh, one is Norm Macdonald, and uh, who we we just lost. Um, the uh, the Bob Saget roast, who we also just lost, but the Bob Saget roast on Comedy Central. Um, which is just uh, if you've never if, if you if you don't know what a roast is, maybe some of our younger, you know, because that's like roasts were huge decades ago and they're kind of mm. making a little bit of a comeback. But uh, it's where there's some famous person, uh, frequently a comedian, but not always right, who who gets up and is like is like the they're the, the person that's being honored. And then there's like a the dais, as it's called, is a is a like sitting on stage is a collection of celebrities, most of which are comedians. And then they go one at a time and insult the person who is you know to give, pay tribute to them by like by making jokes where they're they are the punchline and um the bob saget one was i was in tears the first time i saw it i was in tears the 74th time i saw it i've seen it so many times but norm mcdonald's his bit in that was he was intentionally trying to not be funny mm. and uh i mean he was saying like just like the most, ra- except it was it was actually art how well he was able to write truly horrible jokes, like jokes where you could see where the thing was going. By the third word, you were like, "No, he this is not where this is going because this will be disappointing." And then he just kept doing it, and the audience was like, "You know, they're in a they're in the mood. They want to laugh. It's Norm Macdonald. He's from Saturday Night Live. Like they want to laugh, but they couldn't because it wasn't funny. The audience wasn't really getting it, but the dais realized how brilliant what he was doing was." 
And so all of these professional comedians are dying of laughter. The audience is like kind of chuckling because they feel like they ought to be because like Jeffrey Ross is about to fall out of his chair and Bob Saget is like having trouble staying upright because he's laughing so hard, but they don't get it. And he just keeps, he doubles and triples and quadruples down on being completely unfunny. And it's, it's just brilliant. Uh, and the other one is, um, is Mitch Hedberg who uh, is also no longer with us, but, um, but his like stoner Stephen Wright. Yeah. He's like stoner <laughs> Stephen Wright. Exactly. Where, yeah. Like he, he, one of my favorite Mitch Hedberg lines <laughs> is that, you know, like if you know, what is it that uh, like an, an escalator can, can never be broken. It just becomes stairs. You know, it's just like, and his delivery is, which I won't try to mimic cause I, I won't get it right. It's just so, so yeah, I, I'm a big fan of comedy where the line is like, is so good. It's like, so like, why didn't I think of that? I mean, I'm not mm. a comedian, but like, it's just so obviously funny, uh, but that's, but th- th- where, where the greats can take something that's obvious and point it out. And then you go <laughs> so like, funny. Oh yeah. Yeah. So a dog is always in push up position. <laughs> <laughs> and then he tells that and he goes, that was stupid. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, it cracks me up i did i was gonna have rice last night but i decided i did not want to eat 1000 of anything <laughs> <laughs> what's wrong with you man oh, that guy was brilliant yeah that uh, he was brilliant <laughs> and uh all right La- houghton horns houghton horns oh i gotta put my glasses on for this you ready <laughs> oh I, I wasn't i think so houghton horns 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 houghton hama Hama, 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 hama time. Bo, 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 bo. Houghton Horns aims to spread the joy of music through providing the highest level of product, services, and resources to the brass playing community. 15-day money-back guarantee with free shipping on all new instruments and accessories with multiple easy financing options. On all inventory, terms and conditions apply. I'm just skipping every other bullet point. Mouthpieces by Greg Black, Lasky, Pickett, Shilke, and more. Repairs and customizations are done in-house. Free equipment consultations in person and virtual or virtual, are available with their team of professional musicians. Schedule yours at HoughtonHorns.com. You can watch over 200 unique videos on Houghton Horn, Houghton Horns YouTube channel, YouTube.com, <laughs> forward slash Houghton Horns. And if you enter the promo code JUNKIES at online checkout, you receive 10% off your purchase from HoughtonHorns.com. Some limitations apply. <laughs> there you go. That was, that was an adventure, man. It was an adventure. That was uh, that was that was interesting. Yep. Uh, all right, so we've got uh, one more question, which um, is is this is a um, this is like a right down the middle of the plate question for Mr. Lance Leduc here. Matt in Prescott, Arizona, would like to know how do you think technology will change our experience in the practice room in ten years? Not at all. Next question. <laughs> Ten years. So, all right. Here's, um, let's see. This is not a promise or a prediction, but here are all the ways in which it could be impacted. And so imagine We're you're in the practice co- room. already copping out here, I see. <clears throat> well, I'm just saying that it's foolhardy to predict what's going to happen. But if the trends continue and the technology that is being developed and already exists gets distributed more completely, then it can be the case that you find yourself in the practice room. And oh, by the way, the practice room, because you're using uh, a VR headset, it could be that you're practicing on the surface of the moon or that you're practicing in Madison Square Garden or that you're practicing in uh, on a mountaintop someplace. You, could, you, you can choose where it is that you're practicing. And so it will... Uh, look and feel and sound like you're there. So with um, a thing called, um, there's a way to map the interior of a space. You take an impulse recording of a place. You can pop a balloon. There's a variety of ways you can do it. And you have an array of microphones or an ambisonic microphone, which records in all directions at the same time. And then it will take, in effect, an audio map of that space. So if you know, I, I want to practice on stage at, uh, Suntory Hall in Tokyo, and that's my go-to spot, then you can put yourself there with uh, uh, a headset that will be smaller than this in 10 years. This is an Oculus Rift, uh, or sorry, Quest 2. Um, <clears throat> but more likely, in 10 years actually, more likely that it will be some form factor much more related to your glasses, and potentially it could be contact lenses at that point. 
and then um, you can be wherever you want to be. You can make the space live or dead. You can do some of these things already. With enough money, you can do everything that I'm saying to you right now, just about everything I'm saying to you right now. So it's just not evenly distributed right now. You can, you know, the Wenger has the, the studio set up that... Um, it, um, the Wenger. <laughs> Wenger. Uh, Wenger has a, um, an audio system which will allow you to tune the room that you're in and make it sound like a concert hall or a church or a recital hall or a, a recording studio so you can uh, affect the way it sounds. So <clears throat> already I don't know if just... I've used the most up-to-date version. In fact, I probably think I haven't. It's like it's cool, but it doesn't feel like it's like 100% fully baked yet. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's it. Yeah. And more, um, and no slam on them. That's just sort no. of the zero. Because I'm the sitting in a is, winger chair right now, so like literally, I. But no, no slam on them. Just where the hard the part is, is that there have to be microphones in there as well as speakers. So mm -hmm. the design of the space, in terms of making sure you don't get feedback, is a not insignificant portion right. of that problem. And so right now we we've built a virtual recital hall of the recital hall at, at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And we've also got the virtual audio. But mm -hmm. currently, to experience the audio, you have to put earbuds or headphones on, and then you play, and then we mix uh, a microphone along with the ambient room with the room sound, so that you so that it simulates it that way. So some of this stuff is clunky, but possible. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's just from an experiential standpoint. Then let's say the things that you need to do. Um, in terms of, let's just go with uh, tempo and intonation. So for tempo, it can be the case that you have, in your virtual space, you have a floating um, metronome that blinks. If you want it to blink, you don't hear it, you just see it. It could be the case that you're wearing some sort of haptic device. There's already some watches that will tap the tempo that you want to be. It can also be the case, so you asked. This is gonna be a long answer. Um, uh, I sensors I didn't ask. are cheap. Matt, Matt asked. I read Matt. Matt. So it can Sensors are comparatively like in technology. Certain things are more expensive than others. Duh. Um, so like building a robot that would push your valves down would be very expensive. Having sensors on the valves that uh, or a sensor attached to one of the valves that also had a haptic. Um, uh, component to it so that it would let you know if you were speeding up or slowing down or maybe the way you were let's say on your phone you were the grip with the left hand there was a haptic sensor that would um you could have it trigger if you're going more than five cents sharp or flat you could have it send you some sort of a impulse or it could be in terms of the vr ar thing it could be that you have some visual cue like it like you do on the tonal sensor where there's like this will just be on all the time you can just have it be a part of it um, and then, oh, by the way, the stand will have dematerialized. You won't need an iPad if you're in the VR because you'll just have a display, which right now is difficult um, to get the resolution to be able to read music is a difficult uh, challenge right now. Um, but you'll just the music will just be there. And so then if you're if, if it's a form function like glasses where you can't tell that the person is doing that. Well, now all of a sudden outside of the practice room, you could have everybody's on stage, but nobody has any music stands there. And so the, the, the musicians will still be able to read music. They'll just be seeing it in a visual display and cues and clues about um, intonation and time. And possibly even um, reminders. Let's say you're you're starting out on uh, uh, on a on an instrument. It could be that there are reminders. Uh, you could have accidentals could be in a different color, just to be you give you a little bit more of a nudge, like hey, don't forget this, or um, a roadmap consideration, a repeat sign, or a, a DS or a DC. Although. When paper is no longer an issue, then the notion of a repeat, you may not even need a repeat. You might just keep it scrolling in real time, just like Guitar Hero. Oh, the man. tunes just keep coming, so you just Rest could keep Rest in peace, Coda. It. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to worry about the roadmap. You just keep playing until it terminates. Huh. So um, then, additionally, you'll likely have the capacity to record. When we think about recording ourselves in the practice room, um, uh, we... We think audio first, most of us, and then video. Oh, I can take video of myself. But then ultimately, you'll be able to take 360 video and 360 audio of you. So then you could go back and you're still in the VR thing. There's actually, the, there's a platform now called, super creepy name. It's called, it's called Body Swap. 
And in body swap, you go do, and they've been using it in educational purposes, for educational purposes and for, for hiring. So you can go do a mock interview uh, with an interviewer and you sit and you watch in VR. Um, you have this person who's asking you questions. And then when the interview's over, you can flip a switch and it puts you in the interviewer's chair and you watch how you responded to the questions. So you see how many times or how often your body language changed or if you got tensed up or if you said uh, a whole bunch of times or if you didn't look at the person. So you'll be able to look, you record a, a, an excerpt of yourself and then you can have a literal out of body experience where you see yourself perform that thing in 360 with 360 audio and you can walk around and notice that your right shoulder is doing this or that when you did x that you didn't get a full breath and you can start to get at being uh, a better teacher for yourself and you can scale it up and scale it down like if you wanted to have just a smaller version of yourself and you just want to plop it down and then spin it around and look at it for this way or that way or you know it's like you wanted to really zoom in and see what is your right hand doing or what's happening at your chop um, <clears throat> you could do that hmm. and then um, uh, well another thing is that you could I mean it could be the case that you had some um, robotic assistance or AI assistance. And so the AI, so it could be, you know, if you are, if you are, if you have some sort of physical situation that requires a modification to an instrument, robotics is a way that that, that could assist you. And it could also open the door to a lots more people uh, participating in uh, music making that, that can't now uh, either, well, for a variety of reasons. And then likewise, um, if we um, look at something like AI, it could be the case that, um, you have your practice session and as soon as the practice session is over, then well, it could be that the practice session is designed by the AI. It's been recording every, you know, it's just your recorder is on at all times. So when you're warming up for band class, when you're getting ready for your lesson, when you're having your lesson, when you're in rehearsal, when you're in chamber, uh, uh, whatever, when you're in pep band, it's recording at all times. And then at the end of every day or every hour or every week or whatever it is, you can uh, get a report that says, Hey, um, you tended to be sharp 26% of the time. You tended to be flat 58% of the time. <laughs> you might need to adjust the, the, the length of your instrument. Your or ear it could sucks. Be the, <laughs> or your ear. Or, and here's some exercises that would help you work on that. Hmm. So the next time you're in a session, a practice session, then it's already dialed up. <clears throat> here's the things that you need to spend some time on. It could also tell you um, this time of day, you tend to do this. This time of day, you tend to do this. In these sort of situations, this. Uh, your heart rate went up when you were blah, blah, blah. So maybe we want to look for some ways for you to work on performance anxiety to help simulate the blah, 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 so that when you're in that situation, you don't have that kind of um, uh, a response. So because we're a lot, lots of us are wearing devices that collect all kinds of information um, um, about us that can be useful um, if we can get the, the Fitbit or the Apple Watch to communicate with, which is the Internet of Things. Uh, we'll get there in a second. Um, if I can get that to communicate with my metronome and or tuner and or recorder and or AI, and oh, by the way, that report, if you want it to, you can have it go straight to your ensemble conductor. You can also have it go to your section leader. You could have it go to your private lesson teacher. You don't have to have it go to any of those. But it could be the case that, you know, the ensemble director, um, they get a little notification when they're coming up on a phrase, hey, so-and-so has really been working on this section. And they just know to keep an ear out for this. Or, you know, there's just there's lots of ways. Um, so the Internet of Things, is because of the sensors and because um, of... 4G and 5G, and because of uh, robust Wi-Fi, it's getting to be the case that anything can have can be connected to the internet. So you see appliances, uh, 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 you know, refrigerators that are connected to the internet right now, and it knows based on the barcodes or whatever what's in the fridge, and hey, you need to buy more milk because the expiration date for whatever. And then it will just automatically, if you ha if you ask it to, some of this exists, some of this is on the verge it'll just the milk will just show up like the refrigerator knows your milk's about to go bad and it already ordered some charged your credit card and the milk is waiting for you on the front porch <clears throat> and so it could be the case that if you put the sensors on your valves um, um, then a horn repair person could say you know based on the sensors in your valves I can tell you're pushing your third valve down at a slight angle which is causing it to wear in such a way that we need to do blank 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 and the repair person knows that 
just because my euphonium is talking to the repair guy. So they don't necessarily, they're not monitoring it on a daily basis, but I take it to the repair person and I go, hey, uh, it's like the black box in a car. You know, it's the computer in the car. I take my horn in and I go, the third valve is sticking. And they go, well, let's see what's happening. They plug in, they go, but, or it's been beamed to them. They go, oh yeah, well, the problem is, is physical. Or the problem is, yeah, there's a 17% wear on your valve guides or there's blah and we need to replace the whatever. And then let's say that all of those things are the case. So everything is networked together and connected. <clears throat> um, I need a new valve guide. Okay, well, you just say, uh, what, what instrument do you play? You know, I'm like, I'm just on the, like either talking to an AI, uh, third valve uh, not working. The AI knows that it's because of the guide. Uh, and I go, great. And they go, what? In they already know, but what instrument do you play? I play the XO Euphonium. Here's the model number. And they go, okay. And then you go 3D print a new valve guide and you just swap out the old one for the new one and you're good to go. Because 3D printing is another thing that will uh, allow you to, oh, I want to try out some mouthpieces. I'm not 100% sure what size and fit that I need. And so materials will be at a, uh, it'll be cheap enough that it may not be the thing that you will ultimately play, and it might be. There's a couple of different technologies with um, 3D printing. Some are reductive, where it starts with a block of something and it pulls it away, and others where it just sort of prints from the prim primordial ooze, like uh, Terminator T2000. Um, <clears throat> so I can try out a different, um, you know, with Parker's, Techno what's nice about Parker, Parker is uniquely positioned to take advantage of this because of the component mouthpiece thing. So he could decide that I'm going to get out of the business of when, when it makes sense to do this, which is not today. Don't do this today, Parker. He could get out of the business of shipping metal to people and, and make, but it could be the design of, uh, could be in the business of the design element and making sure that the specs are such that when he feeds my 3D printer, it has all of the right specs for me to try this and that. Hmm. Uh, and then I can print out the, 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 the cup size that I need or the rim shape or whatever it is. And it's all, it just, it all just happens. Um, uh, in my house. I don't have to go anywhere to do any of that. Hmm. So I would say, uh, to sum up, other than in those ways, not much. <laughs> holy, holy moly. I think that's, I forgot some stuff too, but well, that's a pretty good overview. Yeah, that, that was a good overview. Yeah. There's, um, I am, uh, I am actively remaining, uh, as much as possible on the sidelines of the early wave of the internet of things in terms of like appliances and stuff, because there are just nightmares of like all over the place of when things go wrong, that there's like all sorts of proprietary software where it's like, you have to pay someone an exorbitant amount of money that you can't just get a refrigerator repairman to come over it has to be a licensed person. And then that, it, that like they're overbooked. So it's going to take two months or that it's like really exp or there's some, you know, I've had some I've had some family also that has just had like nightmare experiences and then connected TVs. Now they're like they're broadcasting advertisements like constantly like which which um, yeah, when I have to replace my TV and get a smart TV, because I you're I think for a very long time, you're still going to be able to attach a Apple TV or just a dongle, you know, off the back. Like I am literally not entering my Wi-Fi into the TV. It is going to remain a dumb TV because if you never connect it, it doesn't, you know, because I just don't need it to be. I don't need my son to be seeing ads all the time because like sure. ki kids are really good for ads. They're like, I need, you know, it's like not even I want. It's like I need. It's like, well, no, food and shelter. And then we're, that's like the list. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I mean, and at this point. There's well, and it's we, you know we we're we're in a different we've gone in a different channel, but there's like I've seen these YouTube clips where a kid just tells Alexa, "I want five of these scooters," and then these scooters just show up, and they're like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! How'd that happen?" <laughs> like, okay. I I actually had a conversation with uh with with someone at Amazon. This was like I don't know four years ago because Nicholas uh, woke up and then he he purchased like, you know, like $250 worth of like TV shows, like on, uh, on Amazon, like on the Amazon Prime. He's just like, yes, yes. He bought, he bought whole seasons of shows that we could already stream completely for free. But he was just like, it was like $250 worth. Oh, and like, I just, I got all the, I was like, and the, and they, and, uh, and to their credit, like they got rid of it right away, but they did say, but you need to understand, like, if this happens again, like, you're going to get flagged. So, like, you need to, like, lock it down. I was like, no, I, 
yeah, at that point, I like I put the remote. Uh, I, there's actually a bear trap in our living room now. The remote is inside of it. Uh, no, I just I put all of the you know there was a, he was young enough that we didn't really need all the passcodes yet, but then all of a sudden mm-hmm. he was old enough that we needed all of the passcodes yeah. and everything. It's like oh, apparently he knows how to do that. So yeah, that was well, uh, and that was you fun. know t- the it, t- I was you know I'm projecting ten years out. And I'm I'm way off on some of this stuff. Sure, of course. But the privacy issues are are monumental. Yep. Um, the, you know, there's also something to be said for being unplugged. You know, there's sometimes you just need to get your rear end in the practice room. So I'm not I'm not lobbying for it. Sure. Um, no, but no, I do I, think that it's. I didn't think you were. It it can be a. I think it could be a really inter. It, it's going to be very interesting. And oh, yeah. by the way, it's coming. So you can. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, you decide how much you want to participate in it, if at all. But it's 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 on its way. Yeah. One thing I was thinking about when you were talking about the about like the interview and about being able to watch mm-hmm. yourself from the other side and how you react and stuff. And this is true of all technology. This is not anything new, but this is gonna really um, this is gonna really accentuate the difference between the haves and the have-nots financially 100%. and yeah. uh, otherwise. Because if you can. If you can know ahead of time exactly what it's going to sound like standing on stage auditioning for the Cleveland Orchestra, uh, then um, that's not going to take the place of doing all of the work. But if you've like if you've done all the work, someone hasn't, and you have, and you know what it's going to look like, what it's going to sound like, all of that, um, then uh, that's like a massive advantage. Or for mm-hmm. getting you know, or for interviews, or. Actually, the, the analogy I, I thought of, uh, and, and these people still exist, it's been for a while, like there's this whole, there's this whole subculture of, um, uh, of I know someone who used one of these, like uh, this was, geez, this was 20, almost 25 years ago now, was someone who had an essay coach who ended up mm-hmm. getting into an Ivy League business school. Mm-hmm. This was like super upper crust Manhattan. And, uh, you know, and their parents yet yeah, paid like like three grand, I think it was, for someone who specializes in uh, in writing college essays. Like or not, they didn't write it for you. They they and that, that to be clear, this was not like I'll write you a college essay. This was like you write it and then I tell you what to what to add, what to take out. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like they, it was just, you know, it was like a, a red velvet rope, uh, you know, service, concierge service, if you will. And that's, of course, like a huge advantage to getting into a school when somebody who does that all of the time. Um, and yeah, most people do not have three thousand dollars to help with one specific aspect right. of their, uh, you know, of their. So it's it's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting thing. But that's true of the, all. That's true of all technology. Right. Yeah. It's the, the accessibility, like who, who, who has access to it and it's who has ex- access to it when. Because um, pretty much, I mean, this is. Many, 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 many people have phones now. Mm-hmm. And that means that if you're a musician, then you don't then, like I did, have to go buy a metronome and go buy a tuner. Yep. So <clears throat> it, it moves less quickly than we wished it did. But ultimately, I think, you know, you look at there's going to be, I don't know, five, four, five, six billion people coming onto the Internet in the next five or so years, because especially because of... Um, uh, broadband Wi-Fi and they are in for a treat structure thing because well, the internet's doing great. <laughs> well, except that some people who didn't have electricity a generation ago will now have access to the internet. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's like good. right out of the I gate, joke. and it yeah, will be at, at high. Sp- you know, like we are old enough to remember the dial-up sound, and like you know, you would like initiate a thing and then go get a cup of coffee and come back to see how much of it it had loaded in. Yep. Are you looking for the sound? I, I am looking for the sound, yes. <laughs> and so it the 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 future is like many things severely unequally distributed. And ultimately is it there? Do we have it? Should it? be. Hold on. There it is. <laughs> Young people aren't gonna believe this. This is That's this is the sound. <laughs> That's the sound. And it goes on and on. on. That's that's the money. Yeah. Anyway, that's the music of my childhood. <clears throat> Not even my childhood. Yeah, I was gonna adulthood. say it wasn't your childhood. It was my children's childhood. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm a big fan of Peter Diamandis and his writings. I just actually listened to "The Future Is Faster Than You Think," hmm. 
And that's a third of a trilogy of books. The first was called Abundance. The second is called Bold. And this is the newest one. And it's, it's the reasons for optimism about technological advancement. So, for example, one of the things that they were talking about is how, um, how devastating deforestation has been. But with the advent of drones and there's this technology, there's a, there's a technology using drones and they shoot these cartridges that are uh, uh, seedlings for trees. Hmm. They can plant something like 10,000 trees a day. It shoots this thing into the ground, and it's there's like a protective like uh, hull around it that is that protects it as it goes into the ground, and then it also feeds it and keeps it hydrated long enough for it to start to to do its thing. So his point is yes, absolutely, uh, we're we're doing horrific things to the planet, and technology can be part of the solution for helping uh, get out of that. So the accessibility thing is for real. And I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I, I th I'm sure I've talked about it here before. I'm trying to build some VR and AR capabilities for the School of Music. And to her credit, my um, new dean, so we're hiring a new head of the school. In fact, this afternoon I get to go hear one of the finalists. And we've just hired a new dean. Mary Ellen Poole is the new dean. She was the head of the School of Music at uh, UT Austin. And um, she was like, how do we make sure that this is not just a thing for the haves? And if we can get this to happen, like what, what, what are the ramifications here? And there's a whole bunch of people within a five mile radius of uh, the campus at Carnegie Mellon who could benefit from this, who don't have access to it. And how do yeah. we help that? So, um, yeah, I mean, these are these are thorny questions for sure. Yep. Yep. I just want a stupid TV. That's all I know. Uh, all right. I guess my the reason I'm uh, I'm so one of the reasons I'm so passionate about it is because well, it's just fun to me. But one of the others is that I'm uniquely positioned at Carnegie Mellon because a lot of this stuff is built there. But then third, the passion part is someone's going to make these decisions. Yep. Someone's going to decide what gets developed, what doesn't get developed, who has access to it, what does it look like, how does it work. And yeah. if there's no musicians at the table, well, then somebody's going to make the decision and it could be a good one or a bad one. And we yep. will have, the point will have passed. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad that there are smart people like you who are on the task um, because if it's left smart up, people and me, if the, yeah, that's, what, that's what I said, uh, the uh, yeah, because otherwise it's just, you know, and, and, and uh, yeah, it's also fascinating seeing where all of the norms go, you know, because if it was only left to uh, giant companies who are only worried about short term profits because that's stock price and every single CEO four times a year has to get on the phone and has to say things are better or things are worse and it's very rare that any CEO has the, the runway in front of them guaranteed where they can say, no, it's worse. And that's intentional because in four years, it's going to be way better. They get bailed on quickly, which is why there's all these short term decisions, which are bad for like for everyone. But if it was just left up to the companies, there would be rotating ads constantly on the entire front of every refrigerator on like TVs when they were off. Like it would just be we'd be inundated with like with targeted. And so on. but that's not the case because there are people who are you know, in positions and, you know, yeah. Could you imagine like getting, getting ads in the practice room? Mm -hmm. Like if left to their own devices, mm -hmm. it would absolutely, and they'd be spying on you. And it's like, yeah. So, um, that stuff's all real, right? Because they can squeeze like, you know, if they could squeeze a dollar 50 in revenue out of each person more, they really don't care how invasive it is. But so yeah. I'm glad that there are people who don't have, uh, you know, financial and specifically short-term financial that's the pr problem with our whole system is that it's like it's all it's all built on you know for publicly traded companies it's all about stock price you know yeah. so um all right quick last one bonus question since um since we uh we teased it this is from the book of questions if you were handed an envelope that contained the date of your death and you knew you couldn't do anything to alter your fate would you look i'll give you my answer I think that my answer, I think my answer, if I were you, would be no. And I think the answer for me is yes. And it's because of the age of Nicholas. Like if mm. my kid was out of the, like, because if, I, if I'm if i going to, I hope not. But if I'm going to die in three years, that's like, that, that would kind of move the needle in terms of like, what I do with him, what, you know, how hard I would work to get as much money saved up as pot, you know, I'd start thinking real big, real fast. And, you know, I would call in every single possible favor business wise that I could possibly do. You know, I would just try and make everything go boom right away. 
Um, whereas if like, yeah, you know, if, if I was, if I was in your shoes and my kids are, I mean, you know, Duncan's still in college. It's not like your kids are in their forties, um, and, and both married and settled and, you know, and all that. But, um, but I think it might be, it might be different. So yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question though. Cause like, yeah, if you yeah. can't do anything about it, it's, uh, yeah. But I think like short term, just in terms of thinking about, about the wife and the kid, then I'd probably want to know. I have a hundred percent would not. And the other thing I would do is to stick it to the wall right there. Like literally right here. Right. So that I knew that it was there and that every day I would see that thing and I would go, I don't know, maybe, th maybe that thing says today. So therefore I need to act accordingly. And it's ah. just a reminder that there's a date on that thing and I need to pay attention to what am I, what choices am I making? How am I spending today? Right. Is this, is this, is this last day on earth worthy? You get to uh, an age, and apparently I'm at that age where it's like, oh, is yeah, this last day on earth worthy? And the days that aren't, I get super resentful about, and I don't, I don't really think of it in those terms. But I'm like, what? Well, this is like, this is a joke. You know, why am I, why am I burn, spinning my wheels on that's, X? That's why I've quit some <laughs> stuff recently. Like that's yeah. why, yeah, it's all, it's all about that. And it's not like, wait, do I, I hate this? So I'm going to quit. It's just like, is this? absolutely the way that i want to be spending my time you know yeah. like yeah it's uh and anytime i say yes to anything i'm saying no to other things by definition so right. uh, you know that's that that's the that's the whole thing you know yeah. and today as i said at the very beginning of the episode my son's home sick he, he had like a super low-grade fever he seems to be fine his fever has disappeared like so his energy is a hundred percent what it usually is but anytime, but especially right now with what the world is dealing with, I'm not sending my kid to school yeah. with like, you know, a hundred point nine degree fever. That's not appropriate. <laughs> so, um, but that like, you know, completely, uh, you know, completely side swipe my day in terms of yeah. like what I got a lot of, I had to cancel a dentist appointment. I had to, you know, but it's like, no, but we're here. Like we're about well, to, well, fortunately he downloaded $300 worth of stuff off of Amazon. <laughs> so you're in good shape. He's like, oh, well. I'll go. He's got. I think he's up to like a hundred bucks or something in his uh, in his piggy bank. That would be the first mm. stop. So yeah, that would be the the first stop would be the bank of Nicholas. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> no, I do not have a withdrawal uh, slip. No, I will not show you identification. I'm just yeah. If you want to consider this a hold up, that's fine. I'm taking all of it. Yeah. So yeah, you can talk talk to your mother. Yeah, and she's at school right now. So, well, there you go, Lance LeDuc. How about that? Well, you should put. Uh, do you want me to? <laughs> Do you want me to guess the date that you're gonna die and put it in an envelope and you can you can put it up on the wall? That's pretty funny. And then eventually yeah. you break down and you're like, you know, like 15 years from now, you're like, ha, this was four years ago. I win. <laughs> I win, hippie. That's pretty good. That is pretty good. Well, thank you to everyone for uh, for writing in. You know something? I haven't even mentioned this to you, Lance, but something mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, bandying about is possibly getting a voicemail line for um, for Brass Junkies. Oh, well, that's so funny. So that people could, like, you know, leave, uh, you know, leave a message or could just leave a question. Um, yeah, there was a – I got a pitch email, which was actually something that might be useful. It was, like, a company that, like, that does this as opposed mm -hmm. to all of the – PR professionals who I made the mistake of actually responding to one of them and they were like, great, now I'm going to keep giving you more. And I was like, oh boy. Um, yeah. Don't send people unwanted email. It's just, it's just not, not okay. Anyway, thank you to Suzanne. Thank you to Paul. Thank you to Matt. And thank you, Lance. No, for... thank you. We only had like, we only had like 90 seconds of beeping. That could have been a lot worse. True. Yeah. True. Right? The construction was not so bad. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. And uh, that is going to do it for another episode of The Brass Junk. You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to hear the bonus episode featuring today's guest, please visit patreon.com slash thebrassjunkies to learn how you can support the show and instantly access all bonus materials as well as gain access to a special patron-only Facebook group. 
The Brass Junkies is produced by the amazing, wonderful, and truly inspirational Will Houchen. The theme music was composed by Fernando Dedos and performed by Andrew Hitz and Lance LeDuc. We are at pray for yens on Twitter and Instagram and have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash pray for yens. You can find out more about the Brass Junkies and all the other Pedal Note Media podcasts at pedalnotemedia.com. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.